This is the 11th video in this series on the history of astronomy, and we finally arrived at who I consider to be the most important person in human history. Now everyone's more or less aware of Isaac Newton's accomplishments, but there are a number of misconceptions about his discoveries, even among physicists, due to some historical mistranslations and linguistic inaccuracies, particularly regarding what exactly his three laws of motion say, and how he came up with his law of gravity. So in this video we're going to go over his accomplishments and clear up any modern day misconceptions. Isaac Newton was born in the countryside in England. As a child there were no signs that he was a particularly brilliant or gifted intellect. Even during his university studies he didn't particularly stand out as exceptional. But just as he finished his studies, a great plague hit England and he had to return home and go into social distancing for the next couple years. We all know what that's like. The only difference was, when he went into social distancing, over those next two years he single-handedly made a number of discoveries that would change the world forever. During this time he invented calculus. Now calculus was also invented independently in Germany by Gottfried Leibniz. This goes to show that even though Newton did make incredible innovations and discoveries, he doesn't come out of a vacuum. The state of mathematics was already at the point where calculus was the next logical step. In the case of Isaac Newton, he invented it specifically for the purpose of physics. Just as trigonometry was invented for the purpose of astronomy, calculus was invented for the purpose of physics. He also makes significant advances in the field of optics, he discovers his famous three laws of motion, and he discovers his famous universal law of gravitation. Now most of these advances are made over these two years, but he doesn't tell anyone about them. He seems to have been a bit sensitive to criticism and that made him hesitant to publish his results. So he sits on these discoveries for 20 years until his friend Edmund Halley, the guy from Halley's Comet, urges him to publish his findings and in 1987 he publishes his famous book known today as the Principia, which I'm going to go ahead and say is the most important piece of scientific literature in history. This completely revolutionizes the world and without it, I'm not even sure modern science ever comes about. You'll see why later on in this video. Let's now take a closer look at some of these discoveries, starting with the field of optics. Now we saw that the field of optics had been essentially started by Al-Haytham, and that his book on optics was widely read in Europe, and numerous Europeans built upon that, as does Isaac Newton. He invents modern day color theory. So the color wheel, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, that comes from Newton. Many people are under the impression that he discovered how rainbows work, but if you saw my video on the Islamic Golden Age, you'll know that this had already been discovered by two people independently, Alpharisi and Theodoric of Freiburg, in 1309, based off of al Haytham's book on optics. There also seems to be a common misconception that he discovered the inverse square law of light, that the intensity of light falls off as 1 over the distance squared. This too was already known before Newton. He does however make the discovery of a phenomenon known today as Newton's rings. This comes from the reflection of light from two different surfaces at varying distances from one another. And what he found was that depending on how big the gap between these two surfaces was, you would get varying intensities in the reflected light. Now Newton struggled to explain how this worked, and this was mainly due to the fact that he had convinced himself, through some experimentation, that light was a particle. And given the properties of particles, it's very difficult to explain this ring phenomenon. Turns out, this can easily be explained with a wave theory of light. But then there are other phenomena that the wave theory of light cannot explain. All this would eventually be resolved with the development of quantum mechanics many years later, which said that light is in fact a particle, but the probability of finding it is a wave. And hence you get these strange wave-like properties of a particle. But that's a whole different story. Newton also invents a new kind of telescope, a reflector telescope. Now he didn't invent the first reflector telescope, they already existed, he came up with a new design for a reflector telescope. Reflector telescopes use mirrors instead of lenses. Telescopes with lenses are called refractor telescopes, 
With a refractor telescope, you focus light by bending it through a lens. The problem is how much light bends is dependent on the color of light, so different colors bend differently. And this results in what's called chromatic aberration, where you get this smearing out of different colors in your image. A reflector telescope focuses light through mirrors, and the law of reflection is the same for all colors. So you don't get any sort of chromatic aberration contaminating your image. Of course, I'm sure you're all aware of Newton's laws of motion. But actually, there are some very common misconceptions about these laws and what Newton actually stated versus what is often taught that he stated, even in a modern day physics course. So let's go over these laws one by one to fully understand what exactly Newton said. Before that, if you're enjoying this video so far, please take a quick second to like and subscribe, maybe share with a few friends, leave a comment, and if you'd like to help the channel, there'll be a link to my Ko-fi page at the end of the video. It can also be found in the video description. So starting with Newton's first law, it states that every object perseveres in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line except insofar as it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed thereon. Now this is an English translation, the original text was in Latin, so there's already a possibility of mistranslations here. Newton himself called this law Galileo's law, because it sounds very much like Galileo's law of inertia. Things will keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed unless there's a force to change that. And in most physics classes today, that is how Newton's law is presented, as Galileo's law of inertia. However, Newton's law is more specific than this. And the misconception lies in Newton's use of the word motion. Today, motion is a vague term used colloquially. It's not a physics term with a specific definition. However, in Newton's Principia, it was a physics term with a specific definition. He defined the quantity of motion as mass times velocity, where velocity is a vector. That quantity today is called momentum in physics but Newton called it motion, or quantity of motion. In fact, there are a number of languages where the word for momentum is still quantity of motion. So this law is not saying uniform motion, it's saying uniform momentum. This is the law of conservation of momentum. In absence of forces, the momentum stays constant, which is in the same spirit, but different from Galileo's law. Now the law of conservation of momentum had been discovered by Newton's contemporary, a guy we call in English, Christian Huygens. But he was Dutch, and I believe, I don't speak Dutch, but I believe his name is actually pronounced Huygens. If somebody speaks Dutch, you can tell me if I'm right about that. Huygens, or Huygens, is also one of the most important people in the history of physics. Regarding conservation of momentum, he had run some experiments with colliding balls and found that the total momentum of the system was always conserved. That is to say, the momentum of the two balls added together was the same before as after, even if the individual momenta of each ball changed. The total, the sum of the two, didn't change. Howhins is also the guy who came up with the wave theory of light, I believe. I don't know for sure if he's the first person to suggest this, but he's definitely the person who put this theory on the map. Moving on to Newton's second law of motion, this one states that the change of motion of an object is proportional to the force impressed and is made in the direction of the straight line in which the force is impressed. Again, we see the use of the word motion. And now we know this means momentum. So the change in momentum is proportional to the force and in the same direction as the force. This law is actually the definition of force. Mathematically, you write this as the force is the time derivative of momentum. The second law is not F equals MA. F equals change in momentum over change in time. In the case where a mass is constant, then that will reduce to mass times acceleration, or MA. But if your mass is changing, like say a snowball picking up snow as it rolls down a hill, if you use F equals MA, you're gonna get the wrong answer. And if you'd like to know how that works, I actually have a video on the physics of a ball rolling down a hill. I invite you to check it out. So the second law technically is not a law. It's just the definition of force. This is what we mean by force. The first law is a law. It's something that's just observed empirically. We don't know why it's true. We just observe it to be true. 
Newton's third law states, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction, or the mutual action of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. In this case, the word action is a synonym for force. This law is also not a true law. It is actually just a logical consequence to the first two. So what it's saying is, when there's a force between two objects, each object will feel the same force, but in the opposite direction. So the force on A by B is equal to negative the force on B by A. Thanks to these three laws, we can now actually do real physics. We now have an algorithmic, formulaic way of figuring out how things move. All this was in the Principia, and if that wasn't enough, it also had Newton's law of universal gravitation, which many of you have probably heard the famous legend that he came up with when an apple fell on his head. This story is probably just a legend. What is true though, is that he did come up with the law of gravity as a result of watching an apple fall. We have contemporary writings by one of his friends telling us that he was walking in the park with Newton and Newton told him, it's under that tree that I saw the apple fall that gave me the idea for gravity. How this story went from observing an apple fall to the apple hit him in the head, well, this might just be the natural tendency of human beings to embellish stories as they get repeatedly told. Or maybe, and this is purely speculative, people thought the idea was so crazy that a rumor started going around that, well, the apple must have hit him in the head because this idea is insane. You might think that's silly, but it actually took a little time for Newton's laws to be widely accepted. And one of the reasons for this is that despite Europe now becoming scientifically literate, the powers that be, in particular the religious authorities, were generally very much opposed to scientific endeavor. And they did all sorts of things to try to impede this. If you've been watching this series, you'll know that scientific advancement in the Muslim world had been effectively stomped out by religious dogma. And Europe was well on its way to following the same path. There were excommunications, people were arrested, book burnings, universities were condemned, all because the religious authorities generally viewed mathematics and scientific pursuit as either a threat to Christian doctrine and or heretic ideas that were coming in from the Muslim world. And up until now, they were pretty effective at stomping out scientific pursuit. And I personally believe that if Newton hadn't come along, they would have succeeded. But Newton's laws worked so well, and his law of gravity worked so well, that there was just no denying that this is how the world works. And if you'd like to see more on how scientific knowledge slowly came into Europe from the Muslim world, you can watch my video on the rise of the Europeans in this series. So, Newton watches this apple fall and realizes it's accelerating downwards, there must be a force pulling it down according to my second law. Then he starts to think about projectiles. The apple fell straight down because it had no sideways velocity. But if it has sideways velocity, it's going to move in an arc shape, specifically in a parabola. Now, in this picture, we've got a cannonball shooting across a flat ground. And that works perfectly fine for speeds that humans can produce. But Newton realizes, in reality, the Earth is round. So what if I gave it a really fast sideways trajectory? What's going to happen? Well, if the cannonball is shot far enough, you're going to have to start taking into account the fact that the Earth is round. The cannonball will now curve around the surface of the Earth. And the faster you shoot it, the further around the Earth it'll curve. And if you shoot it really fast, eventually the Earth is going to curve away from it at the same rate that the ball is trying to curve down towards the Earth. And so the ball is going to wrap around the Earth and come back to the same point. And we now have orbital motion. The moon must be falling towards the Earth, but because it's also moving sideways, it keeps missing the Earth because the Earth is curving away from it. So now he's really onto something. He's realized the thing that causes the apple to fall is the same thing that causes orbital motion. Now he just has to figure out how this force works. And he basically just guesses it. He reasons, well, the force must be related to the mass of the Earth, that's what's pulling the apple down, and more massive objects are heavier, so this force should be proportional to the mass of the Earth and the mass of the object, or more generally, the mass of the two objects that are attracting one another. He also reasons it must point towards the object, and specifically towards the center of mass of the object, so radially. 
If you're not familiar with vector notation, this just says that it's pointing in the radial direction. The negative means it's attractive. Then he reasons it must have something to do with the distance between the objects. If an object is really far away, it probably is not going to feel this force. So it should be stronger if you're closer to the object. But how much stronger? Well, he knows that the intensity of light follows this inverse square law, so it falls off as 1 over the distance squared. And this is a property of spherical symmetry. And since he's guessing that his force is spherically symmetric, he thinks, well, maybe gravity follows the same rule. So he puts it all together and comes up with this force where g is just some constant of proportionality. Today it's called Newton's constant, but he doesn't know what it is at the time. It wouldn't be figured out until the Cavendish experiment. If you'd like to know how that was done, I have a video on it. Now that he knows his force, he combines it with his laws of motion and computes the consequences of this force for a general orbit and what pops out? All three of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler didn't know why these laws worked, he just found them by fitting to his data, but now he's shown that the same force that governs falling objects on Earth is responsible for orbital motion. So in the next few videos, we're going to use Newton's laws to derive Kepler's laws one at a time. So be sure to stay tuned. If you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified for the least of future physics videos. And if you'd like to support the channel, I would be most grateful. You can follow the link to my Ko-fi page, or you can just leave a super thanks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.